Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome you all to the 11th lecture of the NPTEL MOOCs course titled uh, Psychology of Stress, Health and Wellbeing. So, this is second lecture in module 4. So, before we talk about today's lecture, let us uh, have a brief recap of the last lecture that is lecture 10. So, in the last lecture, we talked about the meaning of coping strategies and the process of coping. So, we discussed that you know coping strategies basically includes all kinds of thoughts and behaviors that we do to manage the demands of a stressful circumstances. So, all things that we do at the thought level and the action level to manage the demands of a stressful circumstances or to deal with a stressful circumstances is called as uh, are can be collectively called as coping strategies. So, it may have various strategies and we have discussed that understanding coping strategy is very important and very significant primarily because uh, use of maladaptive coping or unhealthy coping strategies or inability to cope with stressful circumstances may lead to various negative consequences of stress and its outcomes in terms of uh, you know, physical and mental diseases. And therefore, to lead a productive life and a healthy life, one needs to understand how to cope with different uh, no, uh, stressful circumstances of life. So, it is a very important topic uh, that we have tried to understand. Uh, and then we have discussed that you know there are various categories of coping strategies or responses uh, where you no know, strategies can be divided into various types. So, we have discussed three such categories. One is called problem focused coping versus emotion focused coping. So, the idea is we can deal with a situation uh, by solving the problem that caused the stress or by reducing the stress associated with the stressful circumstances. So, there are emotional consequences of a stressful circumstances which is called as emotion focused coping strategies. Uh, coping strategies can be uh, also categorized as engagement coping versus disengagement coping. Engagement coping basically when we cope with a situation by actively dealing with the circumstances and in disengagement we kind of try to avoid the situation uh, in order to uh, you know, deal with the situation. And the third category which we have discussed is adaptive versus maladaptive coping. Uh, in the adaptive coping strategies basically are healthy coping strategies where we adequately address the stressful stressors associated in the circumstances and we try to uh, deal with the situations in a better healthy way. Uh, and in maladaptive coping strategies are basically uh, when we use various strategies which are of limited value and short term and which may not really serve purpose uh, in a long term, uh, long term sense. So, these were uh, different ways of looking at uh, coping strategies and we use various coping strategies and many of them come under you know these categories. Then we have discussed uh, you know some common maladaptive coping strategies which we use in our day to day life. In that context we have discussed avoidance or giving up coping strategy uh, which is also very common uh, a lot of people use that. Uh, the idea of avoidance coping is basically is a kind of disengagement coping where you know we try to make efforts to escape or distance ourselves from the stressful events or its associated emotions, negative emotions. So, these are basically you know people try to uh, reduce stress in a short term sense uh, and but it such coping strategies are not healthy and adaptive in a long term sense 
primarily because you know they don't solve the problem and um, ultimately in the future we have to deal with such situations again and then things become things may become more complicated and there may be you know shortage of time etc uh, then we have discussed you know uh, another uh, syndrome which is called as learned helplessness uh, in the context of avoidance coping uh, so we try to understand uh, by the uh, concept of learned helplessness which basically means uh, it occurs when someone experiences you know repeated negative uh, uncontrollable situations in their past when someone experiences you know inescapable situations or negative situations which they cannot control so because of this past learning or conditioning that has happened where we, one could not change or control the situation uh, this is kind of generalized to future events and many other similar events so in future when things changes and success is possible control is possible uh, such people don't try to change the circumstances uh, simply because of past conditioning so they become more passive and unmotivated and uh, we try to explain some of the experiments that led to the discovery of such syndrome and we have also discussed that you know learned helplessness may contribute to various psychological disorders such as depression and anxiety where it could be one of the contributing factors uh, not may not be the only factor then we have discussed another cop common uh, uh, maladaptive coping strategy uh, is self indulgence uh, which basically means you know when people engage in excessive unrestrained uh, or impulsive satisfaction of their desires uh, impulses or urges and this happens prime most uh, significantly uh, when we experience stressful circumstances and uh, the research shows that when we experience stress and overwhelming emotions our ability to control emotions and the impulses decreases and as a result we get we are more likely to engage in you know self indulgence kind of behavior which may be excessive drinking smoking etc uh, again self indulgence is like avoidance it gives you a temporary relief so you kind of simply you know avoid the actual situation and you know you just divert yourself into another another uh, temporarily pleasure seeking uh, no, activities uh, but it may not solve the problem in long term so that is why this is also called as maladaptive coping in that sense and it may also have many you know health cons consequences economic consequences also uh, because of excessive drinking or you no know, uh, or you know excessive self indulgence kind of behavior may have many you know health consequences and economic consequences also and also we have discussed another important uh, recent kind of uh, you know addiction which is called as internet addiction which is kind of uh, becoming more and more common in uh, today's world because of too much dependence on technology uh, which may also be one of the important aspects of dealing with stressful circumstances where you get you know, kind of get impulsively use internet uh, or other technology related you know addictions can come into play and the last one we have discussed was kind of self blame and excessive negative thoughts uh, which also sometimes stressful circumstances may stimulate many you know ruminative negative thoughts uh, and intrusive thoughts and uh, which are also called as catastrophic thoughts so, so too much of dwelling in such thoughts are also maladaptive because and counterproductive uh, simply because they don't help you to come out of the situation so um, and some people are more prone to uh, you know use or dwell into more uh, excessive negative thoughts so we have discussed uh, some of these things and more of these things will be discussed in the upcoming lectures so these are some of the uh, maladaptive coping strategies common examples that we have seen uh, in the last lecture so today we'll talk about uh, another coping uh, st strategies uh, which are called as defensive coping uh, which are also generally of limited values uh, but we also use them very frequently and uh, mostly unconsciously so we'll talk about a defensive coping uh, and we'll talk about basics of sigmund freud's theory because it is an outcome of freud's theory
what is a part of Freud's theory and uh, and we will discuss different you know categories of defense mechanisms. So, defensive coping uh, is a particular type of coping strategy mm -hmm. which are also called as defense mechanisms. Uh, these are basically unconscious psychological responses uh, that distort reality to protect people from being overwhelmed by the feelings of anxiety, painful emotions, ideas and drives. So, uh, basically defensive coping or defense mechanism uh, include various unconscious psychological response. So, unconsciously our mind does something on um, some mechanisms to and kind of distort reality, uh, so that we can, uh, so that an emotional situation or a stressful situation become less overwhelming, less stressful, less emotional. So, it is a kind of inner mechanisms to protect ourselves. Uh, by which we uh, distort reality in such a way that it looks more less stressful, less overwhelming. So, these are called as defense mechanisms or defense defensive coping strategies. These are unconscious ways of coping with anxiety. So, typically anxiety and stress you know uh, many times we consciously do many coping strategies that we have discussed, uh, but many times we deal with such situation in an unconscious way. We I may not be consciously aware of it, but uh, unconsciously our mind does a lot of things to protect ourselves from overwhelming anxieties and stress. So, for example, sometimes people refuse to admit some aspects of reality by denying or blocking it from experiencing it as accepting it may cause anxiety. So, many times for example, denial people get into the mode of denial, they do not accept some aspect of reality that is there and they will simply refuse it or they may you know, unconsciously believe in it just to protect themselves. For example, you know a smoker or chain smoker may deny that smoking causes cancer. Unconsciously he may simply you know deny it, you know it, uh, he will uh, say that it is not true. Simply because if he accept that smoking causes cancer and he still smokes, it will crea create a lot of anxiety. So, unconsciously he will deny it. So, this is an example of uh, you know, defensive coping. It may not be conscious, but it can be at the unconscious level. The idea of defense mechanism is one of the original contribution of Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud is, is one of the uh, you know, celebrated you know, psychologist uh, who, whose theory has was you know has been very popular uh, not only in psychology but also in other fields such as literature, you know, uh, media's filmmaking, etc. Uh, where you know, his ideas have been reflected or used in a diverse context uh, in his uh, theory of psychoanalysis. Uh, and specifically uh, the idea of defense mechanism was also kind of uh, further developed by uh, his uh, daughter, her name was Anna Freud. Uh, she kind of developed uh, further uh, from his from her father's theory about this concept of defense mechanism. Now, Freud discovered the five major properties of defense mechanisms when you talk about defense mechanism. One is defense mechanism are unconscious mental processes. One thing is it is mostly unconscious. Uh, we do not do it many times consciously. So, it ha may happen automatically. They help us to manage instincts and effects. So, help us to manage our impulses, our you know anxieties and you know, whatever you know, overwhelming emotions. They are discrete from each other. So, there are many defense mechanisms, we will look into them. So, they are all different from each other. They are dynamic and reversible, they are very you know dynamic in the sense they are not like static defense mechanism, one may change defense mechanism uh, and it could be reversed also. A defense mechanism can be adaptive as well as pathological. So, many defense mechanisms uh, can be adaptive in a, some sense, but many of them are maladaptive also. So, these are kind of an example of defense mechanism with limited values. So, they can be helpful in some extent, but uh, may not be very healthy in a other sense. But some defense mechanism can be uh, uh, adaptive and healthy. 
Now, before we talk about uh, different defense mechanisms, uh, it is important to understand some of the basic ideas of Sigmund Freud. Uh, otherwise, probably we will not understand, you know, uh, uh, the basic basic idea and what is the mechanisms of defense mechanism mechanism or defense safe coping. So, it is it will be important just to give some brief idea. We will not go too much details about the Freud's theory because his theory is very very complicated and very uh, and it is beyond the scope of uh, today's lecture. So, we will just touch on very brief ideas, major ideas of uh, Freud's theory. So, one of the um, fundamental contribution or one of the uh, original idea of uh, Freud's theory is that he talked about different levels of human mind. Uh, so, this idea was there in the philosophy, but in the in psychology he kind of did an elaborate analysis of human mind. And uh, he says human mind is not just one thing, you know, one conscious entity that we are aware of. Uh, so, there are three levels of human mind, uh, which are basically called as conscious mind, subconscious mind or also called as preconscious mind and uh, the third part of mind is called as unconscious mind. So, these divisions of mind is primarily based on the levels of awareness that we have about those parts of mind. So, if you are fully aware about some part of our mind, then it is conscious mind. If you are not so aware about it, then it is subconscious. If you are not at all aware of certain aspects of our mind, then that part is called as unconscious mind. Each level of this mind plays very important role in our behavior. So, as the name suggests, conscious mind or conscious level of mind uh, consists of all thoughts, memories, feelings that we are aware of or conscious in a particular moment. So, for example, now you are listening to uh, this lecture and you are thinking about the concepts that are discussed and you are aware about it. This is the concept we, uh, we are discussing and these are the thought processes going on in your mind. So, because simply because you are aware and conscious about it. So, this part of mind about which we are conscious is called as conscious mind or conscious part of mind. The another part of human mind is called as preconscious or subconscious mind which consists of thoughts, feelings and memories uh, that are not conscious at the moment, but can be easily brought into the conscious mind. So, these are more like not fully conscious, not fully unconscious. So, that is that, that is why it is called as subconscious, kind of half conscious, half unconscious kind of contents of our mind are at the level of subconscious mind. So, many thoughts and feelings which we are not really fully conscious about it, uh, but if we dwell on them little bit, it comes to our conscious mind. So, such contents are basically part of uh, subconscious mind or preconscious mind. For example, uh, you may not recall the name of a person you met in the past immediately. Sometimes we are not able to recall the name of a person we met immediately, you cannot, but we know that I know the name of that person. So, if, it, if I try a little bit that name I can remember and come to my mind. So, such contents are kind of you know part of subconscious mind. So, this part of mind is more like a mental waiting room. So, contents are there kind of you know sitting in a waiting room and you can kind of extract them with a little bit of effort. So, that is called as preconscious or subconscious part of our mind. Our mind has another part uh, which is called as unconscious mind. So, as the term suggests, it includes all mental processes that are inaccessible and outside our conscious mind. So, this is that part of our mind which is fully unconscious and we are not at all aware of what is going on there. So, we are not at all conscious about it. It is completely below our conscious level and uh, uh, so, simply our conscious mind is not in uh, kind of aware of the contents of that part. However, it influences our behavior and thoughts continuously and is a major source of behavior. In fact, Freud 
gave lot of importance to this part of mind simply because it it is that part of mind which continuously influences our behavior and we may not be aware about it even though it is unconscious but it is continuously influencing our you know our thought processes and our behavior uh it mostly consists of repressed unpleasant and unacceptable experiences and feelings so mostly whenever let's say some overwhelming uh, things happens or events happens in our life and our conscious mind is not able to deal with that so there is a mechanism where no this those contents are repressed and they go into the unconscious part of mind so they don't banish from our even though we may not able to remember something but they are still there in our unconscious part of mind and from there it can influence you so let's say something very bad happened in your childhood so those memories and those incidences may still be there in your unconscious mind and it may influence you throughout your life so according to freud this is the largest part of our mind so this is one of the uh, kind of significant part of his theory and that at least this is the largest part of our mind even though we are not aware of it at all so it was a kind of radical idea and that is why you know uh, uh, people kind of you know uh, his theory got lot of attention and lot of criticism was also for that so because uh, you know when you propose that you know your the, the largest section of your mind is unconscious so and it is kind of influence so, so there is not much control over it so uh, this is uh, the three uh, parts of human mind so human mind is according to freud is not just one thing on one unit which we are conscious of uh, but it it has three levels conscious subconscious and unconscious mind freud used an analogy of iceberg that if you put an iceberg into water uh, what happens that a small portion or tip of the iceberg remains above the water and he says our conscious mind is just that tip of the iceberg the part of the iceberg submerged but visible a little part of iceberg will be visible but it is below the water that visible part is subconscious part of mind and the largest part of iceberg actually lies below the water which is invisible and that represents our unconscious mind so he used this analogy to kind of make people understand these three levels or three divisions of human mind so iceberg analogy we can just draw it like this so let's say this is a piece of ice or iceberg if you put it in the, into the water so generally just tip of it will be above the water so he called it so this part is just like conscious mind a small section will be below water but still visible this part he called as subconscious mind however this largest part of it will be invisible and below the water he called you know this part as unconscious mind so this is the analogy that he has used to kind of explain his lab uh, con the concept or theory of mind uh, freud also talked about uh, the structure of human personality how human personalities are kind of what is the architecture of human personality how it is structured what are the components of it so freud kind of he uh, uh, viewed human personality or what what is the kind of what makes a person the kind of person he or she is uh, 
he viewed human personality as a kind of energy system, you know. And the nature of personality is determined by distribution of this energy. So, let us say, we, uh, let us assume that we have a fixed amount of energy we have, that every human has certain t level of energy. And this energy is distributed into the, the different parts of personality. And based on this distribution, which part receives uh, the most energy, uh, our personality is determined based on that. So, he said a human personality has three important structures or three important parts. One is called as id, id, id. One is called as ego, e g o ego. And the th third part is called as super ego. So, let us see what are these three parts. So, our energy is distributed into these three parts and based on that uh, our personality is determined. So, let us see uh, one by one each of this uh, structure. So, the first is id. So, these are term basically he used and took it from the um, uh, no, Greek mythologies uh, to kind of explain some concepts. So, id id uh, basically is it is the reservoir of psych psychic energy and operates on pleasure principle. That is it motivates us to seek pleasure and avoid pain. It is irrational, illogical, primitive and drives people to seek immediate gratification of desires. So, it is that part of our personality which functions based on pleasure principle. So, it is only that part of our personality which always seeks pleasure and avoids pain and wants immediate gratification of desires and impulses. And it is mostly irrational, illogical and primitive. So, it does not think what is right, what is wrong. So, if I want something so which is pleasurable, it will try to fill it or kind of get it immediately. So, gratification is the only, only uh, important function of this uh, part of human mind. So, it is instinctual immature comp component of our personality. So, it is mostly that instinctive behavior that we do. So, if I need this, so immediately I will grab it without thinking whether it is right or wrong. So, id part kinds of propel those kind of behavior. So, this is primary component of our personality and only component present from birth. So, when a child you know, takes birth, uh, initially the child is only it. So, child has no other component of personality, it is only, it only functions based on id principle or id aspect is there. So, child if you can notice a child, it is con 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 continuously kind of functioning based on pleasure principles. So, the ch if child is hungry, it will, it will want immediate gratification of hunger. So, it will just ask for food and if you do not give food, it will start crying. So, it does not understand anything else. So, if child gets pleasure in something, it will want it immediately without really thinking ki whether it is right or wrong or whether it is you know possible to get or not. So, child will want to get it at any cost immediately, otherwise it will start crying. So, child typically functions only on the id, id aspect. So, because, because no other part has developed in a child. So, a baby after birth is entirely ruled by the id component of the personality. So, id aspect. So, this is when initially a child takes birth, it is primarily id only, which works based on pleasure principles, gratification of desires. It is mostly illogical, irrational, child does not know logic and rational aspects. Uh, it just functions based on you know, pleasure aspects. Pleasures and avoidance of pain. Then the second part of human personality is called ego, which is not typical. Uh, Typically, it does not mean uh, the typical in the typical sense of ego that we use in our day to day function. So, Freud meant it little bit differently. So, ego starts to develop at around the age of 3 years from the id, from the id aspect, because child is was initially only id, from the id aspect, ego starts to develop somewhere at around age 3. And this ego aspect operates on the reality principle. So, slowly, slowly child learns to, learns and understands that, okay, 
uh, I cannot get everything that I always you know immediately want. So, there is a reality outside and based on that you know you may get something you may not get something. So, slowly slowly this reality principles develops which is ego according to Freud and ego ensures socially acceptable ways of id impulses. So, ego always uh, is based on reality. What is the reality outside based on that you need to function. So, it will always see whether if I am doing something is it socially acceptable or appropriate or not. So, that is the function of reality principle that is the function of ego aspect of personality. So, it is rational part it is completely irrational whereas, ego is rational. rational. So, at the age of th around 3 uh, that the rationality slowly starts to develop in a child and it matures slowly. So, it is the rational part of our personality that postpones the gratification of id impulses. So, so id may want something to you know for example, you know wants to eat something which is you know very pleasurable for example, you know. So, but ego may say do not eat it immediately uh, because of whatever circumstances. So, it will postpone the gratification of id impulses to a later appropriate time. So, uh, whenever there is an appropriate situation arises, uh, then ego will say at that time you uh, fulfill those desires. In order to deal with the reality, ego resort to defense mechanism by distorting reality. So, the defense mechanism that we are talking about or defensive coping, it is primarily you know done by ego part of human personality to manage the impulses of id and other anxiety that is created. So, we will look into that. So, ego is primarily very rational logical and it will always guide you to find appropriate moments to gratif for gratification. So, let us say if doctor says you know because of some disease uh, do not eat let us say fatty food, but you like fatty food. So, whenever you go to a restaurant your eat, eat part will immediately say you know go and you know get it and eat it because you know it is pleasurable. Ego may say do not eat it you uh, know maybe you can eat little bit of it. Um, and with certain interval of time whatever. So, acceptable ways of doing something. The third part is called as super ego, then slowly slowly uh, the another part of personality develops somewhere around the age of 5 years which is called as super ego, uh, which is the last component of personality. And according to Freud it super ego basically you know operates on the moral principle. So, morality develops slowly slowly then what is right what is wrong you know uh, what should be done in a situation what is morally right what is morally wrong. So, those concepts slowly slowly develops somewhere around the age of 5 and uh, all these moral principles kinds of forms into super ego aspect of our personality. So, super ego internalizes moral standards of right and wrong from the society and parents and directs our behavior accordingly and it influences our judgments and decision making etcetera. So, uh, super ego uh, focuses on what is ideal rather than what is real. So, ego is more concerned with what is real what is reality outside and based on that it will do appropriate behavior. Uh, super ego is more concerned with the ideal what is the ideal thing to be, to be done based on you know, philosophies or ideas or moral principles. So, this is the difference between ego and super ego. Ego is realistic, super ego is idealistic. So, this is the difference. So, most of the things that you know we learn that it is not good to steal or tell lie, these are all part of our super ego, uh, which kinds of guides us to uh, you know, moral uh, behaviors. So, I mean uh, we can just draw one more diagram to understand it little bit more. So, we have uh, ego which works on reality principle and then we have id pleasure principle. Then we have super ego, uh, 
which is moral principle. And all these three part of personality continuously interact with each other. It is not that they are isolated kind of thing. They continuously interact with each other because human uh, you know, mind continuously deals with all the different circumstances and each part has to kind of continuously interact with each other. So, there is a constant interaction. This shows the dynamic aspect of our personality. So, there is a constant uh, no, interaction and dynamism in terms of how things influences us. So, here ego has the most you know difficult function in terms of managing the reality what is around us. It makes lot of demands in terms of impulses and wants to gratify lot of you know impulses and desires. So, lot of demands come from it. Super ego has also kinds of moral demands and other things and ego kinds of balances all the demands. So, a healthy ego is very important in terms of a healthy personality according to Ford's theory. Uh, not ego in the sense of pride, but ego in the sense of managing or kinds of making connection with the reality. So, it kinds of balances the demands from both id and super ego. So, id, ego and super ego continuously interact with each other as we have uh, shown in the diagram and a healthy personality will have a balanced interaction between them and imbalances will lead to maladaptive personality. So, many psychological disorder may arise uh, simply because there is not balance between id, ego and super ego for whatever reasons. So, this imbalance may create or may various psychological dysfunctions. For example, a very dominant id in a person. So, although id starts from birth and then ego develops, super ego develops, but in the adulthood also some people may not actually you know, develop properly their super ego part or their ego part. So, those imbalances may remain in our adulthood also. So, some part may become more dominant, some part may become less dominant depending on uh, the way we are conditioned in our life. So, for example, a very dominant id in a person may make him highly impulsive and may engage in behavior without any concern for appropriateness such as a criminal. So, many times you know if, if id becomes very dominant in a person, even an adult person where id is very dominant. So, such people will become very impulsive and they will try to get gratify at any cost you know their own desires without any concern for others well being. So, they will they may kill somebody you know still some something simply to gratify their own desires. So, such person for example, lot of criminals. So, one of the explanation from the Freudian perspective is that they have a very strong id and ego and super ego is not very developed. On the other hand, a person with a very dominant super ego, some person has a very strong super ego, they become very idealistic kind of people, very moralistic people very judgmental kind of people. So, they may always think what is right, what is wrong, what is morally appropriate. So, very moralistic kind of people, their super ego part is very developed. Now, ego has a tough duty to balance the demands of both id and super ego as I said, you know kinds of because e ego is the only part of personality which is in touch with reality and it has to balance demands from both id which is very irrational super ego which is also very idealistic sometimes which may not be realistic. So, it has to balance it's, it, it has a tough job in terms of balancing the demands from both id and super ego. And as a result ego sometimes resorts to various defense mechanism or defensive coping to maintain the, this balance. Okay. To maintain this balance ego sometimes uses defense mechanism unconsciously. So, this is the background of how ego function or sorry defense mechanism functions or how he defense mechanism functions. So, it is the ego part of human personality according to Freud that resorts to various defense mechanism to maintain balance in our personality and particularly the demands from Eden super ego. 
Now, let us see with this background, we can now understand uh, defense mechanisms. So, there are diverse defense mechanism Freud has talked about and his daughter also, ha, daughter also developed some other defense mechanism talked about. So, human being uh, resorts to various kinds of defense mechanism in our day to day functions. So, we will discuss some of these defense mechanisms. So, one defense mechanism uh, which is called as a repression and associated with it is called as suppression. So, repression and suppression. So, repression basically means is, is, is an unconscious removing, blocking, forgetting of unpleasant thoughts, impulses or memories. Sometimes because uh, let us say after traumatic event, many people uh, do not remember many aspects of the event, they simply forget about it. So, this is an example of repression. So, because of what our mind unconsciously uh, protects us, if some uh, events uh, are very disturbing, you simply forget it. So, it represses these memories to your unconscious mind. So, for example, sometimes people do not able to remember traumatic memories that happened in childhood or you know, sometimes even immediately also we do not remember. So, it, these are simply pushed back to our unconscious mind. So, this is called as repression. So, this is a defense mechanism our mind uses. Suppression is just like repression, again things are pushed back, but suppression is more conscious, little bit more conscious. So, you consciously do not think about it, you kind of distract yourself and something. So, that is more about suppression. Denial as we have already also discussed, denial is another defense mechanism that people use. So, in denial it is simply refusing to admit or accept a particular aspect of reality. So, sometimes simply because the reality is very disturbing, so person simply denies it or simply do not accept it, it says no it is not true. So, this is denial you know. Uh, you might have seen lot of people you know after death of some loved one you know, simply people deny it, it has not happened. So, sometimes because of two overwhelming emotions, sometimes people simply cannot accept it. So, it can happen in very overwhelming emotions also and sometimes it may happen also. Uh, for example, you know specifically people use denial when they are unable to face or accept some aspect of reality of their life. So, some other examples could be for example, a person is addicted to drugs, simply deny that he or she is doing anything wrong. So, because if he accept it is a wrong thing to do take drugs, it will be very disturbing, so he simply denies it. So, people use such kind of mechanisms or defensive mechanism uh, to protect themselves, their, their uh, you know, self esteem or their you know, from the overwhelming emotions and negative aspects simply deny many time people deny some aspects of reality. Another defense mechanism is called as regression. So, regression basically means you regress back. So, you just go backward in your developmental stage. Progress means you go forward, regress means you go backward. So, in regression what happens uh, when confronted with stress and anxiety, sometimes people display immature behavior that have relieved anxiety in the past. So, for example, especially the childhood behavior, whenever you experience stress and anxiety, what a child does? For example, it will start crying and throwing tantrums and things around the room. Many adults also regress back to such behavior when they experience stress or anxieties. For example, an adult might respond to a frustrations by crying or throwing tantrums which was helpful during the childhood, but still people sometimes as a defense mechanism, you know they do not know what to do, they out of frustration they just regress back to their childhood behavior, where they will start crying or throwing things around them. Uh, so, this is an example of regression as a defense mechanism. Uh, the next uh, defense mechanism is called as rationalization. What happens in rationalization is that you know here we give logical, rational or socially acceptable reasons for our unacceptable behaviors or feelings. So, sometimes we do something or we uh, which is not socially acceptable or you think people will not like it. So, you give a more acceptable, more you know uh, uh, more rational and logical reason. So, that whatever you have done 
looks less less in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, less disturbing or at least it protects you from protects your ego or protects your uh, you know self esteem so that you know you make up or come up with a reason which is more socially acceptable then people will say okay i mean that means it is not his fault or something so for example so you find a rational or reasons or logical reasons for doing something which is unacceptable or some behavior where you no know, it is not very socially acceptable or likable kind of thing so for example people may rationalize their failure by blaming others or outside situation so you fail or let's say you did not you could not perform well in an exam so you may find a rationalization by saying that you know uh, i could not read because i was ill or the teacher was not good or the paper was very tough or something some logical reason socially acceptable reason people may give to kind of protect themselves so that it is not it doesn't look that bad or fault doesn't lie on you so you will find some excuses so that is the meaning of rationalization and it's a defense mechanism people may many time use it unconsciously also another defense mechanism is called as intellectualization what happens here is that you know we try to reduce anxiety by reacting to an event or a situation in a detached cold ways so when it is a very emotional situation we don't react it very emotionally but we react it in a very detached and cold ways it helps us to avoid thinking about emotional aspect of an event by focusing on the intellectual component so you kind of detach yourself from the emotional component of the event and focus on intellectual component more thinking component for example reacting to a death of loved one by saying that everybody will die one day and we cannot control death so it's a kind of you are intellectualizing an emotional event so that you know you are able to deal with the situation many time it happens unconsciously you know so because death of loved one you know uh, can be very emotionally disturbing so sometimes people uh, use intellectualization as a defense mechanism by saying that you know everybody has to die one day and people other people also kinds of many times in our society you know tell these things so that people can you know, cope with the situation and that everybody will die one day and we cannot do anything about it and something like that so these are examples of intellectualization the, this is a defense mechanism that a lot of people use the next defense mechanism is called as displacement so in displacement uh, it involves taking out our frustrations aggressions impulses on people or objects that are less threatening so you kind of displace your anger frustration from one person to another person who is less threatening because you cannot express your anger and frustration to someone simply because that person may be you know if you express them it will be very dangerous or that person is of higher stature stature than you in terms of whatever it is then you displace those anger which was originally you know created by a person you displace it to someone else who is less threatening so for example displaced anger or aggression is very common it's a very common thing that lot of people do where people express and take out their anger on spouses or children let's say that was actually originated in their office because of their boss or something so so they were very frustrated or angry with their boss in the office but they could not express that anger simply because you know boss expressing that could be very dangerous to their job so they come home and express all the frustration and anger to their spouse or children so they will start you know angry behaviors and shouting and abusing so this is an example of displaced anger so it originated in somewhere else but you are expressing it somewhere else so this is the example of displacement as a defense mechanism which is also quite commonly used the next defense mechanism is called as projection in projection people attribute their unacceptable characteristics or qualities to another person 
So you project your own unacceptable qualities on someone else. You don't accept that it is in me, but you say it is in that person. So you attribute your unacceptable qualities on someone else. So this is called as projection. Simply because you know if you accept it is in me, you will feel uncomfortable. So you don't accept it, so you just project it on someone else. For example, a person with adulterous nature may blame his partner of cheating him. He himself has this desire of extramarital, let us say, you know, adulterous behavior or let us say in a married situation, extramarital kinds of desires are there. So, he may engage in projection and say, your partner or spouse has that desire or at least or cheating you. So, kinds of you are projecting your unacceptable uh, qualities on someone else. So, this is uh, this is called as projection as a defense mechanism. A lot of people sometimes use that. Uh, the next uh, defense mechanism is called as reaction formation. Here the person tries to deal with anxiety by behaving in opposite ways of the actual feeling and thinking. So, in reaction formation what do you do? You, are, you just behave in opposite ways of what is actual your own actual feelings. By using this defense mechanism people hide their true feelings about something by showing exaggerated opposite behavior. So, they try to hide what is actuality which because you know they may not feel comfortable in uh, you know, expressing it or they themselves may not feel comfortable. So, they behave in just opposite ways especially with exaggerated ways. For example, a person expressing exaggerated sadness or crying on the death of a person who was disliked by him. So, many times people you know you may not like that person at all or you may heavily dislike that person, highly dislike that person and, uh, and on the death of that person you show excessive crying and sadness. So, you kind of showing a reaction formation as a defense mechanism. So, those may not be your true feeling, but kind of you are engaging in a behavior to kind of defend something within you. The next one is called as compensation. So, it involves developing talents in one area to compensate for failure in another area. So, compensation is also kinds of you know many people use it. Uh, so, when they fail in a particular area in life, they compensate that failure by developing talents in another area. For example, you know you developing talents and skills in sports to overcome weakness in academics. So, someone is let us say weak in academics, he will try to compensate that weakness by developing talents and skills in something else such as sports or maybe extracurricular activities something else. So, it is a kind of you know thing that motivates people to compensate their failure in something. And this could be also seen as a defense mechanism. Uh, then comes uh, uh, sublimation as a defense mechanism. Uh, Freud said this is one of the you know, healthy ways of defense mechanism. So, it involves expressing unacceptable impulses by converting them into more acceptable forms. So, if you have some unacceptable uh, inappropriate impulses, you convert them into more appropriate form. So, that is called sublimation, you kind of transform them into another form. For example, a person with a lot of anger and aggression, he simply sublimate his anger and oppression by joining some sports such as boxing where he can express lot of his anger and expression. Now, if you show your anger and aggression in a, in, a, in normal social situations, it will not be accepted by people and people may look you in a very negative way. But let us say you use that anger and join a profession such as boxing where you can express your anger, it, 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 it is converted into more acceptable form where people you know you can develop a career out of it and uh, people will appreciate your if you are good at it. So, it is an example of sublimation. So, it is one of the most healthy and successful defense mechanism. So, uh, there are many uh, probably some many other uh, defense mechanisms. So, these are some of the common defense mechanism that we all use in our day to day functions. And, uh, these defense mechanisms uh, are they all pathological? No. Uh, 
defense mechanism they, they vary in their adaptiveness some may be more maladaptive and some may be more adaptive however excessive use of defense mechanism can be detrimental to mental health because you know you are distorting reality you are not kind of in touch with uh, you know reality and uh, you know ego kinds of distort your reality to protect you so too much of distortion is not good some form of defense mechanism some of it is is common and it is okay all people uses it but if some people resort too much of defense mechanism then uh, he will kinds of slowly lose lose touch with the reality which may not be good for mental health uh, valiant as a, uh, a researcher you know who proposed a hierarchical structure of defense mechanism and he proposed that you know there can be four levels of defense mechanism level 1 is psychotic or pathological defenses such as denial or extreme pro projection uh, they could be uh, you know psychotic or kind of pathological defense mechanism too much of it is really you know such defense mechanisms may be very bad for mental health level 2 are immature defenses such as fantasy projection uh, so people may use them sometimes but they are very immature kind of defense mechanism level 3 is neurotic defenses uh, so mostly you know lot of emotional instability and those kind of thing so here you know which includes uh, displacement intellectualization reaction formation repression and these are all examples of neurotic defenses and four is mature defenses which are in mature in the sense they are more little healthy in that sense such as sublimation humor suppression and these are more mature form of defenses so defense mechanism can vary in their functions in their adaptiveness and uh, depending on that you know some defense mechanism are more maladaptive as compared to others but excessive use of too much of defense mechanism can be detrimental in the long run Uh, but you know we all use it in uh, many context and some of it is okay mm, but excess of anything is bad so it is same here also so this is all about uh, defensive coping so we have discussed you know both uh, mostly uh, what is we try to introduce the concept of coping strategies and we discussed some examples of maladaptive copings including unconscious defensive coping strategies so with this we end today's lecture and the next lecture we'll talk about constructive coping thank you